Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As we are about to have our readings, welcome. Good to see you this evening. Welcome to those online. This is the second of what is called the three days, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Vigil of Easter. It's thought of as one continuous service, so we pick up where we left off last night. The first lesson is from the book of Isaiah, chapters 52 and 53. The fourth servant poem promises ultimate vindication for the servant who made his life an offering for sin. The servant pours himself out to death and is numbered with the transgressors, images that the early church saw as important keys for understanding the death of Jesus. A reading from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we account him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid us on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he has taken away, who he was taken away, who could have imagined his future. For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him will the Lord, the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The second lesson is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. In the death of Jesus, forgiveness of sins is accomplished, and access to God is established. Hence, when we gather together for worship and when we love others, we experience anew the benefits of Jesus' death. A reading from Hebrews. After the Holy Spirit says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. We will sing it three times just as Jesus asked his disciples to stay with him three times. The gospel this evening comes from the 18th and 19th chapters of John. On Good Friday, the story of Jesus' passion, from his arrest to his burial, is read in its entirety from the gospel of John. You may be seated for now. I'll ask you to stand later on in the reading. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Judas said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the chief priests and elders that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The temple leaders replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did another tell you, did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the temple authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the temple leaders again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the temple authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. 
everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the temple leaders, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. Please stand as you're able. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top, so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the chief priests did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the temple authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Passion of the Lord. You may be seated.
Since I was pretty young, I've enjoyed the show Austin City Limits. It features live performances by all kinds of bands. In the first few decades of the show, it was mostly country, western, folk, that type of music. More recent decades, it's branched out to include the evolving music scene in Austin, rock, pop, alternative, even some hip hop, you name it. A few weeks ago, they aired a special, inducting an artist into the Austin City Limits Hall of Fame. Now, I will confess that I hadn't heard of this person, maybe some of you had. His name is Joe Ely. He's a Texas singer-songwriter who has worked in rock, country, folk, honky-tonk, and Tex-Mex. He had a band called the Flatlanders, and he was also good friends with the band The Cure because why not? At the ceremony, Joe was introduced by a Pulitzer Award-winning writer and journalist named Lawrence Wright. Lawrence told a lot of stories, many of them humorous, about Joe's life and career. He shared about the time Joe showed him around the Texas panhandle, especially Lubbock, where he was from, uh, where Joe grew up. He started his career. It turns out that Lubbock, Texas was a home for many famous folks. Jimmy Dean, Sonny Curtis, Tanya Tucker, Mac Davis, Delbert McClinton, Lloyd and Natalie Maines, the Gatlin brothers, and even Buddy Holly. At one point on the tour, Joe took Lawrence into a Walmart and stopped near an aisle full of diapers. After letting Lawrence feel confused for a moment, he shared that it was the spot where Buddy Holly was born. Why was Lubbock, Lawrence wondered, in the middle of nowhere, Texas, the home of so many great singers and other artists. According to singer Terry Allen, another Lubbock native, you could look so far over the horizon there that eventually you would see the back of your head. <laughs> so what was it about this place that sparked so much creativity? Because it sounds desolate, boring, uninspiring. Near the end of Lawrence's introduction, he told the story of how Joe Ely took him to a cemetery to see the grave of Buddy Holly, covered in guitar picks by fans who had come to pay their respects. Joe looked out at the vast horizon and said, I think all the emptiness made me want to fill it up. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the, her the earth was a formless void. And darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. A formless void covered in darkness sounds desolate, boring, uninspiring. But God responded to that void, that emptiness, by filling it up with creation. Yeah, uh, astral bodies, the laws of physics, biological matter, plants and creatures of all kinds. And also with people created in the image of God. The God who creates, the God who is eternal relationship, three in one, one in three. God saw all that emptiness and wanted lovingly to fill it up. We humans created in the image of this God also encounter emptiness. Sometimes in the form of hungers, desires, sometimes in the form of sadness or despair, sometimes in the form of brokenness and pain. Sometimes the emptiness is around us, in the world, in the ones we love, in strangers we see. Sometimes we encounter the emptiness within our very selves. Sometimes we encounter emptiness and we make music. We fill it with beauty. But we are not God. Since that first paradisical garden, we make choices that all too often attempt to fill the emptiness we encounter, but not in life-giving ways. In the language of our Christian faith, the word that we give to these non-life-giving actions is sin. Sin that hurts ourselves, others, 
loved ones, strangers, even creation itself. Sin that becomes embedded, systematic, ensnaring. Sin is on display in the story of the passion. Hunger ill-filled. Attempts to fill the emptiness that leave you just as empty as before, if not more so. Whatever Judas's motives were, there's different theories to that. Whatever whispers of the devil he heard, he tried to fill the emptiness with what he thought was the right thing, betraying Jesus, hurting his friend and teacher. We do that. Betray our friends, our family, our ethics, our consciences. Trading short-term gratification or some false sense of security for the well-being of others. The soldiers and the police with their torches and clubs. Peter drawing his sword and cutting off the ear of that servant. Trying to fill the emptiness of fear, the emptiness that fear creates with violent attempts to lash out and hurt back. We do that. We wound with words and deeds. We defend some imaginary territorial fortifications in a world that God created for interconnectedness. We get stuck in a mentality of us versus them. It's either you or me. Chief priests and the elders and the scribes, they tried to fill an insatiable emptiness for power and control by scapegoating Jesus. They told themselves that they were putting the needs of the many over the life of this one, which, you know, maybe they really thought that. But they also didn't want to lose their power, their control, even though they themselves were being controlled by the Romans. They were powerless when it came down to it, but they'd rather have that illusion. Their emptiness convinced them that Jesus was a threat. We do that. It's in the news all the time. It sells lots of advertising. We scapegoat others all the time, putting, passing blame and condemnation on others, usually the most vulnerable, because what are they going to do about it? Because they can't really fight, because it makes us feel full, safe. Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times, trading solidarity for short-lived security. Again, an illusion, really. We do that. We attempt to fill emptiness with factions and sides, self-preservation above all. Less so with those closest to us, sure. But God created us for relationship, for community with everybody, the whole creation. All human beings. Why else would there be guitar picks on Buddy Holly's grave? Yet we shed the bonds of love the moment we feel our sense of security threatened. The bonds of love that God baked into us in our original clay. All that back and forth between Pilate and Annas and Caiaphas, the chief priests, all the bureaucracy that was erasing humanity and dignity for Jesus arguing over what the sign says that's hanging over the man who's currently actively dying. Emptiness filled by an overabundance of structure and punishment. We do that. We live in the most incarcerated society on the planet. Of course, as a society, there must be consequences to actions, but there also can be compassion. Needs to be. But rather than changing systems that are broken, that cause suffering, we just shrug and say, but the rules, or that's just how it is. What are you going to do? We wash our hands of it just as surely as Pilate did. The mockery during Jesus' trial, the insults, the abuse, attempting to fill emptiness by attacking or tearing others down, we do that. Read the comments on even the most benign thing on the internet. People are just waiting to pounce, to score a point, not to listen, not to connect, too often. 
We distract from our own emptiness by trying to reduce others to emptiness. Scavenging and picking apart others like the soldiers rolling dice for Jesus' clothes. And then at the end, the chief priests wanted Jesus' body removed so that the sight of it wouldn't uh, have an effect on the Passover observance. We do that. One of the most effective ways to deal with emptiness is to simply act like it isn't even there. Cover up the problems like Joseph of Arimathea wrapping Jesus in a cloth, laying it in a tomb. Those are just some of the human actions on display in the Passion. Actions that, in one form or another, human beings still carry on today. But what are Jesus' actions in this story? The Word of God made flesh, the one who fills the emptiness of creation with glorious order, with life-giving community, with gracious love. What did he do in all of this in response? As we saw last night, Jesus invites them to fellowship at the table. He institutes new covenants of life in his blood. He washes their feet in servanthood love. He sets an example for them to follow. And he does this knowing about the emptiness we try to fill and all the non-life-giving ways that we try to fill it. Knowing our sin, he did that anyway. He said, sit with me, eat with me. This is my body. This is my blood. He sets a table and feeds us his love himself. While he was hanging from the cross, Jesus pulls together his own mother and a disciple, a beloved disciple, and ensures that they will be community for one another even after he dies. Relationship for one another, provide care for one another. From the cross, life emptying from his incarnate body, even in that darkest moment, the darkness does not overcome the light. A sliver shines through even in the darkest time. Unlike the other Gospels, John highlights that Jesus carries the cross himself. Now, we should bear each other's burdens just like we wash each other's feet. But here John wanted to show that Jesus didn't pawn his pain off on anyone else. He didn't fill his impending emptiness by inflicting it on others. Like Jesus, we can choose to carry the pain of others like it's our own. We can choose to invite others in our times of pain or emptiness to help us, but we don't make the non-life-giving choice to outsource our pain at others' expense. We bring it into community. As it says in Isaiah, all we, like sheep, go astray. Jesus takes on every bit of our suffering, our emptiness, our pain, our sin received, our sin inflicted, and bears it. Listen to the subject and verb. Jesus said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus, on that hill of crosses, nailed to a cross, died to fill the emptiness, to fill our emptiness, all the emptiness up. God sees our emptiness and sends Jesus to fill it for us, to write a different song in our hearts, to write life-giving laws on our hearts and in our minds. God empties God's own recollection and record of our sins and fills us with grace in exchange. The new song in our hearts is not one of hunger, but of contentment. Not one of anger or hatred or any of the other false fillers, but one of love and grace. Jesus, on the cross, emptied himself so that our emptiness could truly be filled to provoke us to love one another, to wash one another's feet, to set tables for one, or one another, to lay down our lives for one another, to respond to God's love with such good deeds because we know that we are already full. Lord, make us into your song and fill the emptiness with your love through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing, Were You There? Number 353.
invite you to remain standing during the bidding prayer. This is a, a prayer usually used on Good Friday. It's a little different format than what you're used to. You'll notice that Gladdy will introduce that petition. There will be a time for silent prayer for you to add anything that you would like related to that and then a closing prayer. Following that, uh, we will have what is called the Solemn Reproaches, another ancient tradition. Uh, at the end of the service, we will depart in silence. And if you have an offering to share, there will be a basket in the back for you to put that into. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to preserve in, persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton and Virginia Synod Bishop Bob Humphrey, for Pastor Ryan Radke, for the Messiah Lutheran Church Council and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church, increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. 
We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the world in arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. O my people, O my church, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh my people, O oh my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O my people, O my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire 
but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I poured out saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy, holy and immortal, have, have mercy, mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you draw the sword in my name, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy, holy and, and mighty, holy, holy and, and immortal, immortal have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I opened the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy, holy and, and immortal, have, have mercy, mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on a cross. I raised you from death and prepared for you the tree of life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and, mighty, holy holy and immortal, immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God. Holy God. Holy, holy and, and mighty, mighty, holy and, and immortal, have, have mercy, mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and, mighty, holy holy and, and immortal, immortal, have, have mercy, mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I came to you in the least of your brothers and sisters, but I was hungry, and you gave me no food. 
Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, God, holy holy and and mighty, holy holy and and immortal, immortal, have mercy on us. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. 